what they've been changing. Well, I'm glad you're taking me back. Maybe I can do something about it. Come to prayer with me this morning. Gracious, loving God, as we come to you this morning, we come with our thoughts of our hope and our faith. As we come into the season of preparation, the season of Advent, allow us to see the light from the darkness. As we move forward each and every moment, let us learn of the hope, the peace, the joy, and the love. So now as you touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken on this day. Let the words from my mouth and the meditations from each and every one of our hearts ever be acceptable to you. In Christ we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we begin a new series here at Milwaukee Metropolitan Community Church. And I'm not sure about you, but this was a very different Thanksgiving weekend for everyone throughout the world. But we gave thanks entirely in a different way. But I don't know about you, there are just so many Hallmark Christmas movie reruns one can watch over the course of a weekend. Even in this time of pandemic, did you even notice that Black Friday, Merchant Saturday, and whatever else, Cyber Monday, all came early this year? I was getting emails up one side and down the other for this bargain and that bargain. But this morning, we also begin the season of Advent. And Advent is that season that is the start of the church year, even though we're almost at the end of a physical calendar year. It's the birth of Jesus, so we're not winding things down, we're actually just beginning. So begin, being in this time of pandemic, I couldn't have thought of a better sermon series to engage in than Christmas at the Movies. And no, we're not going to focus on all those Hallmark movies, but we're going to look at some of the classics and how those classic movies really relate to the season known as Advent. I do hope that over these next several weeks that you'll take some time to go back and watch some of these holiday classics as we engage in the series incorporating what they are to the Christmas story. This morning we start with Miracle on 34th Street, and I can't think of any better classic to start with, especially coming out of Thanksgiving weekend, because this movie begins with the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. I can remember as a kid, the few times my folks got us up at the crack of dawn and we'd drive into the city, hike our way up to Herald Square and watch those enormous balloon floats come down 34th Street in front of Macy's flagship store. Years later, we would watch it on TV, but believe it or not, Miracle on 34th Street won several Academy Awards and also to be the ninth out of a hundred of those passion fills, films excuse me, that bring joy and hope into one's life. And the entire focus on Miracle on 34th Street focuses on two things, faith and hope, which was the goal that if anyone who watched the movie would understand that by the time you got to the end of the movie, that there was faith and new hope to be had by all. Now, Maureen O'Hara, who plays one of the main characters in this movie, Doris, it's her main function to be one of the key Macy's employees. And it was her job to hire Santa Claus, not only for the parade, but for the store. 
Now this particular par parade, as we know, has become one of the main anchors in getting and putting us into the holiday season. And in fact, if you ever have been to Macy's flagship store, you'll know why it's still considered one of the largest retailers in the world. Now, if you've ever seen or watched the movie or caught the beginning of the trailer to this sermon this morning, Doris is having some trouble hiring and making sure that she has the right Santa Claus. Doris shares a bit about what has happened in her life and that her husband had left to her and her young daughter and is now going through this pattern of not being sure what this Christmas season is going to be like for her and her daughter. And Doris isn't really feeling a lot of joy. She's not even feeling a lot of hope. She definitely isn't feeling peaceful. She's pretty much living in this myth as you watch this portion of the movie. Now, if you really look into Doris at this point, even though it's early in the movie, you'll see that she's looking at life with great skepticism, and you'll see that she has this rejection for Santa Claus, but not what you would think. Doris has lost her faith. It is what we'd call those silly things like Santa Claus and the good things that Christmas may bring. Now, in my opinion, I don't think that Doris has what we call those intangibles in her life. She's lost her faith. She's lost hope. She's even lost peace. She's lost joy, along with losing some of those significant anchors that bind us together when it comes to faith and we walk through life. So for Doris, whatever doesn't fit her direction or thinking, whatever she can't prove intellectually isn't true to Doris. But an underlining tone of what's happening with this movie is that this theme of what we do and what we believe surrounds our understandings all about it. So let's look at the Christmas story for a moment, the season of preparation and the coming of the Christ child. Now, logic and common sense, as you would know, logic and common sense would say, did the Virgin really give birth to a child? And you know the logic and the common sense would say, no way. So logic and understanding comes into play, but also logic and understanding versus the feelings and our heart. Now comes that Christian Christmas story. Now in this particular part of the movie, of course, we are introduced to this character named Kris Kringle. And Kris Kringle makes a very clear and a very strict point that he is Santa Claus. If you've ever watched the movie, he builds it up and believes that he really is Santa Claus and that Doris then does hire him to be the Santa for the store. And if you watch the movie, you'll learn that Chris is against all the commercialization that evolves around Christmas because he thinks that Christmas needs to be something more than just the commercial aspect of it. As you watch the movie, you'll see and, and see things develop more and more as he reminds us what faith and hope is all about. Chris also, if you take note, takes a stand in the unwilling way to yield to the fact of making others do something when they are more likely to not want to do them. Like forcing young children and having their parents buy toys that they don't need. We see Chris come up with this brilliant idea as you watch the movie and the idea that he recommends people to go to other places to buy store, excuse me, buy toys when Macy's were sold out and you couldn't get them. So take a quick look at this little clip. Yes, yes, yes. Peter's a fine name. What do you want for Christmas, Peter? I want a fine, and this like the big ones, only small, it has rows, it's got 12 at one, and I won't do it in the house, I'll only do it in the backyard. I promise. Macy's ain't got me. Nobody's got me. Well, Peter, I can tell you're a good boy. You'll get your fire engine. Oh, thank you very much. You see? I told you he'd get me one. Mm, that's fine. That's just dandy. Listen, you wait over there. Mama wants to thank Santa Claus, too. Say, listen, what's the matter with you? Don't you understand English? 
I tell you, Macy's ain't got any. Nobody's got any. I've been all over. My feet are killing me. Fine thing, promising the kid. Now, you don't think I would have said that unless I was sure, do you? You can get those fire engines at Schoenfeld's on Lexington Avenue. Only eight fifty, a wonderful bargain. Schoenfeld's? I don't get it. Oh, I keep track of the toy market pretty closely. Does that surprise you, sir? Surprise me? Macy, sending people to other stores? Are you kidding me? Well, the only important thing is to make the children happy. And whether Macy or somebody else sells a toy doesn't make any difference. Don't you feel that way? Huh? Oh, me? Oh, yeah, sure. Only I didn't know Macy's did. Well, as long as I'm here, they do. I don't get it. No? I just don't get it. Now, as we just saw, Chris's great idea was to recommend other places to buy the toys elsewhere since Macy's didn't have them. And Mr. Macy at all of this says that what a wonderful way it was because this great man renewed the vigor of the store and had brought great things to be. At the same time, Doris learns very quickly that Chris actually thinks he is Santa Claus and now not sure how to deal with all of this as she moves forward. With that, she hooks Chris up with this Dr. Sawyer, who is the company psychologist. And Dr. Sawyer is going to move him through a process of understanding of who he says he really is. Now through all this, their conversation that Chris and he has, that they learn that Dr. Sawyer and is pretty much along the same lines of Doris, that they have these insecurities and these challenges that start to come before them. And what we learn from this exchange of dialogue between Chris and the doctor is that form of identity that he says and has. I want to remind you of a moment that someone who did the same thing and that person was Jesus. In fact, Jesus came into the world and came into the world for a much greater purpose. He came into the world to ransom many and place us all under God's hand. We also learn in the story that things don't go well for Chris and they don't go as expected where he finds himself placed in the Bellevue Hospital where he is now being looked at as a person without a rational mind. The challenges that come from this now is that Fred, this lawyer, takes up his case while Fred and Doris exchange into a conversation. This conversation where Doris isn't really looking logically at reality and Fred is looking at this whole thing through a heartful side. As we further find our way through the movie, we hear Fred and Doris having a conversation and Fred is telling Doris that someday you're going to find out that the way you face the world just doesn't work. But when you do, don't overlook the lovely intangibles because you'll discover that all things are only things, that they're all worthwhile. I think Fred is giving that message that sometimes we need to look at the world as being very idealistic, looking that words need to be a certain way. Excuse me, looking that the world needs to be a certain way. And that if we look for that proof, and, that, and when we do, if we're looking for it, we just might miss those sightings of God in our life. We miss the perspectives. We miss those moments when God reveals to us in this powerful way and makes that difference in our lives. And the things that we are missing with all this are the things of love and hope and peace and joy. Because without looking at life, the way that we should. We are looking for those answers that we may never find. Now, the climax of this film, Miracle on 34th Street, lands with a courtroom scene where Fred, representing Chris King Kringle, gives it his all and represents Chris in a most powerful way. And doing so, the proof needs to be that someone needs to prove that Chris is who he says he is. Fred calls some key witnesses. He even calls the son of the prosecutor who points out that Chris Kringle is Santa Claus. Fred even pulls Mr. Macy into the courtroom and asks if he believes, of which he acknowledges yes. But yet, the court isn't really sure until Fred does this. So take a quick look. 
letters have just now been delivered to Mr. Kringle by bona fide employees of the post office. I offer them as positive proof that uh, a competent... Three letters, Your Honor, are hardly positive proof. I understand the post office receives thousands of these letters every year. I have further exhibits, Your Honor, but I hesitate to produce them. Oh, I'm sure we'll be very happy to see them. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, produce them, Mr. Gailey. Uh, put them here on my desk. <laughs> but, Your Honor... I... Put them here on the desk. Put them... Yes, Your Honor. So I encourage you, if you haven't already done so, to take time and watch the entire movie because, if anything, it really does renew our faith in having to believe in the things we don't know, the things that we can't see. However, the greater good of this film is that we're not focusing on Santa Claus, but focusing on the deeper things of our faith, the deeper things of hope that brings us closer to the Christ child. And believe me, I didn't write this sermon to be all about Santa Claus, but I wanted us to connect the dots that are important with the story. Now, we understand Chris Kringle, but we didn't really know where his name came from. If you look back, it's a fourth century that the Bishop of Myra was named St. Nicholas. And Nicholas, as a boy, was orphaned at a young age, and his parents, who were killed, left all their wealth to their young son. But as he grew, he learned that he didn't want to do anything with the money. He didn't want the wealth. And he went out on a life and a mission. And he began to give away every dollar he had. He gave it to those who were poor, who were in need, those who couldn't even pay their bills. He poured out his entire life for that. Now the philosopher and theologian Martin Luther took and looked at this into it in a deeper way and determined that there was something greater than St. Nicholas of Myra. He discovered that it really goes more to what the Germans called Kist Kringel or Kungel. Kist Kungel translates in English to Christ child. And it's more about that, that we take these and that tribute of emptying ourselves and give that what we have to others and that we become that Christ child we become the light of the world the miracle is in this movie miracle on 34th Street is that a kind old man helps to remind us what it means to have faith he reminds us what it means to have hope and the storyline behind Doris is that the shackles were removed and that she could once again laugh. She could once again embrace the truth of what God has placed into her, that she could believe in those intangibles all through her heart and could now understand the importance of the faith, the hope, the peace, the joy, and the love. So as we live into the kissed kungal in our lives during this Advent season, living into being that Christ child within us, let us live this season of anticipation, the season of faith and hope, giving of ourselves to others. Amen.